Hello students, in this module we will discuss one more image based questions in general surgery. So this is module 8 that is thyroid and breast pathologies. So case number 1, 35 year old lady presented with diffuse thyroid swelling in the neck. Clinical pictures are shown here. So what is your diagnosis? This is the one picture, this is another picture. Here you are seeing there is a uh, swelling in the neck. It is swelling in both the thyroid lobes. Both You are seeing a butterfly shaped swelling. You, you can see it here. This is the swelling. Uniformly, both the lobes of thyroid are enlarged. And the surface seems to be smooth. It is not nodular. And the second picture, you are seeing exophthalmus. So, with this clinical picture, the diagnosis is Graves disease or this is also known as primary thyrotoxicosis. So, what are the clinical features of this Graves disease? <coughs> Loss of weight in spite of voracious appetite is a classical symptom. Heat intolerance irritability, tremors, tachycardia, eye signs with exophthalmus, pre-tibial myxedema, plumber sign that is proximal myopathy and acropathy that is clubbing with ophthalmopathy and dermopathy. So these are the clinical features of Graves disease. What are the eye signs? Okay, eye signs are you can see exophthalmus but you have to tell the specific signs like the lid lag is known as Van Graaff's sign. <laughs> the characteristic stare with infrequent blinking is known as Telvac sign. And the widened palpebral fissure is known as uh, Dalrymple sign. And for proptosis, that is Nafigaza sign, where you have to stand behind the patient and you have to look down. And if the eyeball is protruding, uh, uh, I mean, uh, beyond the orbital, uh, uh, I mean, the reach, okay, it is a uh, proptosis that you have to make out by standing behind the patient. And Mobius sign is the loss of convergence due to ophthalmoplegia. Geoffrey sign is absence of wrinkling of forehead when patient is looking up. And what are the investigations you have to do in this patient? Any thyroid swelling, you should do three tests like the <coughs> triple assessment in the breast lump. That is thyroid function test, T3, T4 and TSH, ultrasound of the neck and FNAC of the uh, thyroid swelling. If isotope scan is available, that is iodine-123 scan is available, that also you can do. So, what is the treatment in this case, in Graves' disease? So, in Graves' disease, three types of treatment you can do. Medical treatment, you have to give antithyroid drugs like neomercosol and propyl thiouracil. This is one treatment. This you have to give at least for 6 to 10 months. Radioactive iodine ablation with iodine-131. This also you can do. And... If it is not, I mean, res responding to medical treatment, then you have to resort to surgery only. Nowadays, we are doing only total thyroidectomy. Previously, we were doing subtotal thyroidectomy for Graves' disease, but the treatment of choice nowadays is total thyroidectomy. So, this is case number two. 60-year-old lady presented with a long-standing neck lump. See, here also you are seeing a lump in the neck, but unlike the previous one, you see the surface is not smooth. You are seeing multiple nodules in both the lobes of the thyroid gland. So, it is a long-standing uh, chronic neck lump with multinodular goiter involving both the lobes. That is the diagnosis. So, it is a multinodular goiter. It may be with toxicity or without toxicity. The toxicity you have to find out. Yeah, what are the what are the clinical features? You are seeing multiple nodules in both the lobes of the thyroid gland. 
if it is associated with toxicity it is called secondary thyrotoxicosis or plumer's disease pressure effects are very common in this uh, long standing multinodal goiter how will you confirm it by a clinical test you have to do caucus test that is nothing but compression of the swelling will aggravate the pressure effect if you compress it the patient will develop what is called inspiratory stridor or this will aggravate the breathlessness okay that is caucus test in figure in figure 2 here this is nothing but a test called direct laryngoscopy in all patients who are going to undergo thyroidectomy we must do this <coughs> direct laryngoscopy for medico legal purpose to find out the integrity of the recurrent laryngeal nerve whether the recurrent laryngeal nerve has already been a uh, damage or not you have to find out by doing this direct laryngoscopy where you can see these are the vocal cords if both the vocal cords are abducted that means uh, it is a normal both recurrent laryngeal nerves are intact suppose if one side is paralyzed suppose left side is paralyzed is already injured what will happen this uh, uh, vocal cord it won't get abducted it, it won't get abducted it will be in adducted position only this vocal cord will go laterally this won't abduct so this is what this will produce what is called hoarseness of the voice if one recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured patient will go for hoarseness of the voice if both the uh, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerves are injured suppose in this uh, nowadays we are doing total thyroidectomy and if you injured both the recurrent laryngeal nerve both the vocal cords it won't get abducted it will be both will be in adducted position there won't be any space in between this vocal cord even air cannot escape, escape cannot go go through it so patient will experience respiratory difficulty cannot cannot breathe patient cannot breathe so patient will experience acute respiratory distress immediately you have to do tracheostomy to save your patient that is what you have to do and in this picture it is a chest x ray including the neck where you can see this you have to do to find out the position of the trachea suppose if the patient is having a big multinodal goiter like this you cannot feel the trachea through the neck in that case you can take an x ray chest including the neck where you can see this is the trachea you are seeing it you can make out the trachea by seeing the air inside the air inside the trachea you are seeing the trachea the trachea is not here in the midline it has been shifted to the other side i mean the right side that is what you can see it here and what is the treatment for this multinodal goiter you have to do total thyroidectomy yeah that is the treatment for multinodal goiter in this case number 3 30 years old lady is having left sided neck swelling which moves on deglutition surface is smooth and it is firm in consistency okay here you are seeing a swelling which is confined only to the uh, left lobe and if the size of this swelling or the nodule single or it is also known as solitary nodule if the size is more than 4 cm this is known as adenoma of the thyroid if the size is less than 4 cm then it is called solitary nodule of the thyroid gland left thyroid gland so in all the uh, i mean swelling in the neck you have to ask like groin swelling if you are seeing a swelling in the uh, in the neck in groin swelling you will be asking the patient to cough like that in neck swelling you have to ask the patient to swallow during swallowing this swelling if it is arising from the thyroid it moves on deglutition and what is the reason why it is moving on deglutition because this thyroid gland is enclosed tightly by the pretracheal fascia which is attached to the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage <coughs> and uh, and uh, during deglutition or swallowing 
both the thyroid and cricoid cartilage are moving up and along with that the whole pretracheal fascia which is enclosing the thyroid also moves up during the glutation. This is the reason why it moves. How a nodule develops? Okay. Because of fluctuant uh, TSH level, the thyroid follicle will have hemorrhage inside. There will be bleeding inside the thyroid follicle and all these uh, uh, follicles will adhere together and that will eventually will form a nodule. And <coughs> and what investigation is shown in figure 3 and it is importance in this case. So this is a iodine 123 isotope scan. This you have to do in all solitary nodules or in adenomathyroid where you can make out whether uh, you have to find out about this is the nodule you are seeing it in the left lobe. See here here, here, all these things, the nodule is taking taking up more isotope than the rest of the thing. So if it is, <coughs> if the nodule is taking more isotope, that is called hot nodule or hyperactive or autonomous nodule. If it is isoactive, the, the uh, I mean the isotope is taken up equally both by the nodule as well as the rest of the gland. That is called warm nodule. If the nodule is not taking up any of these isotopes, then it is called cold nodule. Cold, among all these three types of nodule, the cold nodule is very dangerous because 20 to 30 percent of them can become malignant. So, what is the treatment of this solitary nodule or adenoma thyroid? If FNAC confirms benign nature of the swelling, then you have to do hemithyroidectomy. But in follicular adenoma, where we cannot differentiate malignancy, then because adenoma and carcinoma, follicular adenoma and follicular carcinoma, you cannot make out by FNAC. So you have to send a frozen section biopsy intraoperatively. And if it comes follicular carcinoma, then you have to do a radical total thyroidectomy. This is what you have to do in this case. So suppose if the solitary nodule or the solitary uh, nodular goiter or the adenoma thyroid is also having uh, toxicity that is called Godsey's disease or tertiary thyrotoxicosis. Case number four, a 50 years old lady presented with a hard neck swelling with pulsatile secondaries on the left side of the skull. The clinical pictures are shown here. You are seeing a swelling in the neck, which is, they are telling it is hard in consistency. And this patient is also having a pulsatile secondary over the skull. See, here also you can see. Here also you can see the swelling in the neck, hard swelling and a pulsatile secondary. This is the characteristic uh, feature. So what is the diagnosis? This is follicular carcinoma of the thyroid because because it is having <coughs> I mean the secondary pulsatile secondary in the skull. What are the risk factors for any carcinoma, carcinoma of the thyroid? If there is history of radiation administered in infancy and childhood, then okay you have to suspect papillary carcinoma. Excessive iodine com consumption is associated with again papillary carcinoma. There is history of long-standing goiter, then it can uh, turn into either anaplastic carcinoma or follicular carcinoma. If patient is having Franksip mutation of red gene, then that is associated with papillary carcinoma. If it is point mutation of red gene, that is uh, associated with medullary carcinoma. If P53 gene mutation is there, that is associated with anaplastic carcinoma. If there is loss of gene at, uh, at chromosome 11, it is associated with follicular carcinoma. What are the five types of carcinoma thyroid? So it, it is papillary, they are papillary carcinoma, follicular carcinoma, Hertel cell carcinoma, medullary carcinoma and anaplastic carcinoma. Among these five, anaplastic has got a very dismal 
or very bad prognosis. Okay, the follicular carcinoma, you cannot differentiate whether it is adenoma or carcinoma by doing FNAC alone. So you must do a frozen section biopsy. Herthel cell carcinoma is a variant of follicular carcinoma only. The medullary carcinoma usually associated with MEN2 syndrome and it runs in family. So if any of your patient is having medullary carcinoma, you have to call all other family members and you have to test them to rule out medullary carcinoma. The patient usually, what are the clinical signs? Usually present as painless neck lump. All carcinoma thyroid are hard in consistency. Very sign is positive. That means if it is carcinoma of the thyroid, usually you cannot palpate the carotid artery pulsation because of invasion of carotid seed. If it is a benign swelling, even if it is a long-standing multinodal goiter, very big swelling, even then you should be able to palpate the carotid artery. But if it is a malignant thyroid, then you may not be able to palpate the carotid artery pulsation and this is what is called Berry's sign. Medullary thyroid carcinoma, I told you already, is associated with MEN2 syndrome. The presence of cervical lymphadenopathy is usually in papillary carcinoma. Presence of pulsatile secondary in the skull is characteristic feature of follicular carcinoma. So what is the treatment in this patient? You have to do all carcinoma thyroid, you have to do uh, radic radical total thyroidectomy. But in papillary carcinoma, you have to do radical neck dissection, you have to remove the lateral lymph nodes also. Whereas in medullary carcinoma, you can do just central neck dissection, you can do in medullary carcinoma. What are the first stop complication of any total thyroidectomy? So early complication is tension hematoma because... That is why, no, normally I used to put a drain, suction drain in all thyroidectomy so that you need not bother about this complication. Whatever blood is going to accumulate, it will come out through that suction drain. If you, are, uh, if, if you have failed to put a drain, suction drain, then uh, blood may accumulate inside and that will produce tension hematoma because the blood cannot come outside. That will compress the trachea and your patient will go for respiratory distress. So how to manage this complication? If you are uh, having enough time and if you are bold enough, okay, you can ship the patient to the theater, ask the on-call surgeon to come and then he will do, he will remove the stitches, remove the uh, blood and clot and then you have to do the hemostasis and then you have to close the neck. This is one method. If you are having enough time, you can do it. But if there is no time for you, then you can do a emergency tracheostomy to save your patient and then lateral, uh, <coughs> later you can take the patient to the OT and you can do the same procedure. You can evacuate this one. The other complications are recurrent laryngeal palsy. If it is unilateral, the patient will go for coarseness of the voice. If it is bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, the patient will experience acute respiratory distress and you have, again, you have to do a tracheostomy to save your patient. Another complication is superior laryngeal nerve palsy. If you injure the superior laryngeal nerve, okay, the patient will go for what is called huskiness of the voice. This, they cannot go for high pitch voice. That is what is called huskiness of the voice. Patient will go, may go for tetany because of injury to the parathyroid glands. And late complication, because you are removing the whole thyroid gland, patient is definitely going to go for hypothyroidism, which you can manage easily by giving thyroid replacement therapy lifelong. Patient may also go for hypertrophic scar or keloid. These two all are late complications. So case number five, this is a 10 years old girl develop a midline neck swelling which moves on deglutition as well as on protrusion of the tongue. So these are the clinical pictures. What is your diagnosis? It is a midline swelling which is moving on not just by deglutition, even on protrusion of the tongue. See, by protrusion of the tongue also, this is moving up. So the diagnosis is thyroglossal cyst. 
see the lateral view also you are seeing here it is a thyroglossal cyst yeah, it develops from the unobliterated thyroglossal duct this is, this is the <coughs> development is from thyroglossal duct which is not obliterated it is uh, what is the development and why it is moving on protrusion of the tongue the embryonic mesoderm which ultimately develops in the thyroid gland descends from the foramen cecum of the tongue to the normal pretracheal area of the thyroid gland because of this embryological connection with the tongue while you are protruding the tongue the thyroglossal cyst also moves up what are the different areas where you can find out i mean this thyroglossal cyst beneath the foramen cecum floor of the mouth supra hyoid area infra hyoid area which is the commonest site or on the thyroid cartilage itself this is the second most commonest site so what are the complications can happen to this patient the thyroglossal cyst may get secondarily infected it may burst open and result in thyroglossal fistula very occasionally malignant transformation can also take place it will turn into papillary carcinoma so how will you manage this case the surgery is called there is no medical management if you are having a thyroglossal cyst or thyroglossal fistula the treatment is six strings operation you have to remove the entire cyst the remove the body of the hyoid bone and the whole thyroglossal tract up to the tongue if you are if you fail to remove the body of the hyoid bone okay the part of the uh, thyroglossal duct will be uh, left behind and the patient may get recurrence of the thyroglossal uh, cyst case number 6 20 years old girl presented with a painless freely mobile lump in her right breast upper and outer quadrant intra operative picture is shown here so what is your diagnosis is 20 years old girl painless freely mobile lump and it, it is this is ultrasound is also shown intra operative picture is also shown so the diagnosis is fibroadenoma okay what you are seeing in figure 2 and figure 3 this is fibroadenoma you can see the lobulation also it is an encapsulated tumor benign tumor freely mobile in figure 2 here you are seeing this is the fibroadenoma this hypoechoic area but unlike malignancy if it is a benign swelling it is broader than taller the height wise it is less than the width this is the characteristic feature of benign swelling if it is a malignant swelling then the height will be more than the breadth that is the thing in the third picture you are seeing what is called popcorn calcification this is a very characteristic feature of chronic fibroadenoma and this is the histology and what is uh, what you will see in the histology the histology of the specimen of fibroadenoma is showing a well circumscribed biphasic lesion Consisting of, consisting of benign stroma and epithelium lined cystic spaces and what do you mean by the triple assessment the triple assessment should be done in all breast lumps even if you think it is a benign one even in fibroadenoma you should do this triple assessment to rule out malignancy it consists of clinical assessment that is both history and physicals you have to do imaging you have to do ultrasound you have to do mammogram ultrasound is those who are younger than 35 years and mammogram those who are elder than 35 years and pathology that is histology you have to do biopsy actually fnac and true cut or core cut but for breast lump the ideal thing is true cut or core cut needle biopsy if you are going to do all the three things in the triple assessment your diagnostic accuracy will be almost 99.9%. So how will you manage a case of fibroadenoma? If it is less than 2 cm size, you can just observe the patient. You can wait and see. If it is more than 2 cm size, then you have to do excision biopsy. You have to excise the tumor 
and send it for biopsy. Case number seven, this is a 55 years old lady presented with a painless lump in the right breast, upper and outer quadrant, which had restricted mobility with some skin changes. So you are seeing a lump in the upper outer quadrant in the right breast here. And if you compare the nipple level, this size, this size it is elevated, it is in a higher, I mean, or it is elevated. Okay. So what is your diagnosis? Here you are seeing pudio orange appearance. So what is your diagnosis? It is a case of most probably it is carcinoma of the uh, breast. But you had to confirm it by doing mammogram and by doing a biopsy. That is true cut biopsy you should do. Okay, the ultrasound you have to do only for those who are younger than 35. This patient you have to do uh, mammogram. That is this side you are seeing some few things. And what are the risk factors? So major risk factors are uh, uh, gender, age, Gender is female gender, elderly patient, previous history of breast cancer, family history or uh, of breast cancer or genetic predisposition like those who are having BRCA1 and BRCA2 positive. Minor uh, factors are early menarche, late menopause, nulliparous women, elderly primary, those who are taking hormone replacement therapy and those who underwent irradiation during childhood. What are the clinical features? Hard, painless lump, restricted mobility, skin changes like pudy orange, retracted nipple, dimpling, tethering and puckering of skin with or without axillary lymphadenopathy. So what are the investigation you have to do to confirm the diagnosis? For those who are elder than 35, you can do mammography. In mammography, you have to look for three things. Dense opacity with irregular margin, microcalcification, and speculated appearance. Yeah, this is called Byrad's grading from 0 to 6. Okay, I will show you in the mammogram. So, this is the mammogram. You are seeing a dense opacity. You are seeing small microcalcification here. And you are seeing hair-like projection from this opacity. This is called speculated appearance. So, this is doubtful. Okay, and this one, the height is more than the width. So, this is also doubt, uh, this is also diagnostic, but you have to confirm all this uh, uh, su suspicious lesion by doing a biopsy, true cut biopsy. <coughs> so, you, you get, what are the different Types of biopsies you can do for breast carcinoma. You can do excision or incision biopsy. This we, nowadays we are not doing it because the moment you cut the breast carcinoma, it starts growing very fast. Or you can do true cut or FNAC, but true cut is better than FNAC. You can do needle localization biopsy or stereotactic biopsy only if clinically the, no lump is palpable, but in mammography you are seeing some suspicious. Listen, then you can do both needle localization or stereotactic biopsy. Sentinel lymph node biopsy you have to do in early breast cancer where there is lymph node enlargement, but you want to confirm whether the lymph node enlargement is because of infection or because of tumor spread. In that case, you have to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Sentinel lymph node biopsy, we can do it two methods. One is dye method. You can use lymphosurin blue dye, inject it and take the first lymph node that is uh, getting blue color, turn into blue color, remove it and send it for pros and section biopsy. This is one method. The another method is <coughs> you have to give radio <coughs> technetium 99 sulfur colloid and then you have to give one day prior to the uh, uh, biopsy. The next day you have to open the axilla and you can pick up that radioactivity by using a um, using a small um, <coughs> uh, you you can use a uh, this uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy will be having this radioactivity. Uh, this you can pick out by a portable gamma camera. You can use and pick it up 
the audio signal will be there. You remove that sentinel lymph node and send it for frozen section biopsy. So what is the treatment for this uh, breast cancer? Okay, I just want to uh, zoom and show it to you. So you, you can divide it into early breast carcinoma, localized advanced breast carcinoma, and advanced breast carcinoma. If it is early breast carcinoma, that is stage 1 and 2. You can, either, the patient can opt either for breast conservation treatment or if the patient is not willing to take any risk, okay, you can do modified radical mastectomy. The breast conservation surgery could be either lumpectomy, wide local excision or quadrantectomy. All these cases you should be followed by radiotherapy also. And you can do axillary dissection also in these cases. Uh, you can do e even uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy, this case. Now, if it is a locally advanced breast carcinoma, that is stage 3, you can do modified radical mastectomy and then you can give adjuvant chemo radiotherapy with or without hormone therapy or you can administer what is called neoadjuvant chemo, radi chemo radiation and then chemotherapy and, and then you can, uh, this is the purpose of giving the neoadjuvant treatment, neoadjuvant chemo radio is to downstage the disease. The stage 3 will become stage 2 or stage 2 and now the patient can even opt for breast conservation surgery. Okay, or if patient is not willing, okay, you can do modified radical. So you can do neoadjuvant also in locally advanced breast cancer. If it is advanced breast cancer or stage 4, then you have to do a cytoreductive surgery or toilet mastectomy. You have to remove as much of the breast as possible, including the tumor. Then postoperatively, you can do adjuvant chemo radiotherapy. This is what you have to do. Um, case number 8, 48 years old lady presented with a huge right breast lump occupying the whole right breast which was non-tender, mobile and with lobulated surface. The histology is shown here. So what is your diagnosis? Patient, huge right breast lump occupying the whole of the right breast but it is non-tender and mobile also. See, this is one. Oh, it is mobile, it is not restricted mobility with lobulated surface or basalated surface. So this is characteristic of phyloidous tumor or serocystic disease of Brody. What are the clinical features? The tumor is massive or huge, non-tender, mobile tumor occupying the whole breast with basalated surface. No skin or chest wall involvement. There is no lymphatic spread. But the malignant variety can spread through the blood and it can metastasize to lungs. Why it is called phyloidous tumor? Because the histological picture looks like a leaf and that is why it is called phyloidous tumor. What is the treatment for this phyloidous tumor? If it is a benign phyloidous tumor, you can do wide local excision with 2 cm margin. You need not do mastectomy. If it is a malignant phyloidus, then you have to do only simple mastectomy. MRM is not performed because there is no lymph node metastasis. So you need not do modified radical mastectomy. Even for malignant phyloidus, you have to do only simple mastectomy. Coming to case number 9, it's a 25 years old girl presented with bloody nipple discharge twice during past two months from her right nipple. On examination, no lump in the breast. Discharge occurred only on pressure over the areola. This is what you are seeing. You are seeing uh, only when you are pressing the areola, the patient is getting the uh, bloody nipple discharge. Okay. What is your diagnosis? With this clinical picture, the diagnosis is intraductal papilloma. How will you differentiate the benign, uh, I mean, swelling from the malignant swelling which is producing bloody nipple discharge. Okay, this I just want to yeah, zoom and yeah. Bene in benign swelling, there is a, a non-spontaneous and it requires, a, you have to press it and then only 
there will be nipple discharge. Whereas in malignant disease, it is spontaneous nipple discharge. The color of the nipple discharge is usually benign, green, yellow, bloody. It is usually multicolor. Whereas in malignant uh, nipple uh, disease, which is producing nipple discharge, it could be clear, it could be pink, usually serosanguinous or bloody. Benign uh, nipple discharge is usually bilateral, whereas malignant nipple discharge is unilateral. <coughs> Presence of underlying palpable breast mass is, uh, it is not there in benign swelling, whereas in malignant swelling, there usually there is an underlying breast mass. The number of ducts in benign discharge, usually it is from multiple ducts. If it is a malignant one, usually the discharge is from single duct. The consistency is sticky in case of benign uh, cases producing the nipple discharge, whereas in case of malignant disease, usually it is a clear discharge, it is not sticky. So what, what other investigation you have to do in, in a case of nipple discharge? You have to do a high resolution ultrasound of the breast to rule out any underlying lump, especially in sub areolar area. You can also do mammogram yeah, to, uh, to find out the swelling. You can also do ductography or even ductoscopy to pick up any intraductal pathology. It could be a intraductal papilloma, which is the commonest cause for bloody nipple discharge, or it could be an intraductal carcinoma. So what are the various causes for the nipple discharge? Okay. So discharge from the surface of the nipple could be Pages disease, maybe skin disease like eczema and psoriasis, uh, uh, so or very rare cause like chancre. Discharge from a single duct, blood stain, it is common in intraductal papilloma and intraductal carcinoma. If it is serous discharge, okay, any color, fibrosis, single duct discharge, fibrocystic disease or duct ectasia. Discharge from more than one duct, blood stain, it is carcinoma or ectasia, uh, duct ectasia. It is black or green in color, duct ectasia. If it is purulent, multiple ducts, Discharge from multiple ducts, duct ectasia. Purulent is uh, in breast abscess. Serous discharge in fibrocystic disease. And lactation, you will have, uh, I, I mean, milk discharge in case of lactation. And what is the treatment in this patient? Intraductal papilloma. So you have to do what is called microdocectomy. You have to cannulate that particular duct and you have to excise the whole duct along with that intraductal papilloma. It is called microdocectomy. Case number 10, 25 years old lactating mother developed acute painful breast swelling in her left breast. On examination, skin is warm and it is tender also. So this is the clinical picture you are seeing. What is the diagnosis? It is a case of breast abscess. Why it is common in lactating mother? Because the bacteria from the oral cavity of the suckling baby can spread easily to the mother's breast if there is any crack in the nipple. Breast abscess is breast abscess in non-lactating breast is uncommon. What is the clinical features? Part or all of the breast is intensely painful, hot, tender, red and swollen. Fever is becoming more pronounced. You have to do ultrasound to localize the abscess. These are the investigation. Mammogram to rule out associated carcinoma, chronic abscess or in inflammatory breast carcinoma. Needle aspiration also you can do to confirm the presence of the pus. What is the treatment in these cases? You can do simple needle aspiration using a wire board needle under local anesthesia. And then you can do what is called guided drainage under Image control with radiological or ultrasound technique, a tube drain can be inserted and left until the cavity is collapsed. If it is a multilocular, I mean uh, abscess, then you have to do only surgical drainage. It is the most certain method. Not only can all loculi be reached 
but also you can remove the dead tissue inside the abscess cavity. The cavity is then dressed regularly and left open to heal by secondary intention.